Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us for the Government of Newfoundland and Labrador's COVID-19 update for today, Wednesday, March 24th. I'll turn things over to Dr. Fitzgerald to give a, her latest update on today's numbers. Thank you, Premier. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, since the media advisory yesterday, we have one new case of COVID-19 in our province in the Eastern Health Region. The individual is between 60 and 69 years of age, and the case is still under investigation. A total, the total number of cases in our province is now 1,015, and there are three active cases, and one person is in hospital due to COVID-19. A total of 122,704 people have been tested to date. We continually assess our measures of epidemic control, and thankfully we have been consistently trending in the right direction in recent weeks. Six weeks ago, during the week of February 10th to 16th, we had reported 260 new cases. We were down to one case over the last week and now one case reported today. The seven day moving average has gone from 40 cases in mid-February to less than one case as of today. And we've had 15 hospitalizations that resulted in seven ICU admissions and unfortunately two deaths during the recent outbreak. The number of admissions has slowed and there has been only one admission to hospital since the end of February. The daily percent positivity in our lab testing is now at 0.3%, down from a high of 4.8% on February 10th, and our seven day average is 0.14%. Since we began reopening, we have not seen evidence of increased viral transmission stemming from either the outbreak or new sources. And in addition, we have not had any new non epi link cases related to the outbreak in at least 28 days, which is two incubation periods for the virus. I'm therefore pleased to announce that the whole province will move to alert level two, effective 12.01 a.m. Saturday, March 27th. This time around, we will all need to do things a little differently. I think it's safe to say we are all startled by this outbreak and how rapidly it escalated and we don't want to be taken by surprise again. We must be mindful that the epidemiology outside our province shows that case counts continue to rise and variants of concern are becoming the dominant strain in many jurisdictions. So it will, we will almost certainly see another variant case in the province. And these are a game changer. They're not the same as the original COVID-19 strain and they spread easier and faster and in many cases by the time someone tests positive, the virus has already spread to their contacts and onwards. So because of the increased, uh, increased risk from the importation of the virus, particularly the variants of concern, we are making some modifications to our level two guidance. We will continue to assess the epidemiology and risk level in the coming weeks to determine if adjustments can be made. We are cautiously increasing the maximum for formal gatherings to 50. This applies to events such as weddings, funerals, and faith-based services when held by an organization or um, a business. And if things continue to go well, we will, and we see sustained low numbers and no new non epilink cases, particularly variants, we hope that we'll be able to raise this number in the coming weeks. The single most important thing that everyone can do right now is to keep your contacts low. In level two, we recommend a steady 20 which means a maximum of 20 close, consistent contacts for your household. This means that your household chooses up to 20 close friends and or family, and these are the individuals that you interact with in close settings, such as in your home or sharing a table at a restaurant. The difference between a contact and a close contact is not defined by your interpersonal relationship with them, but by how often you interact with them, the setting you interact with them in, and how close in proximity you interact with them, as well as how long in duration the close interaction is. So once again, it is defined by people, space, time and place. Just because there are 20 people you can interact with, it doesn't mean that you should have a gathering with all 20 people. Remember that those in your steady 20 may have a different set of contacts from yours. You should not bring people together who are not one another's contacts. For this reason, informal gatherings are not really recommended at this time. If you are thinking of having a, a birthday celebration for your child, please try to keep it small. Your child's full class cohort are not really considered a part of your steady 20. Interactions in school are essential and we want to reduce non-essential interactions. 
So if you have a birthday celebration, please limit it to your child's close friends or your family. If it's possible, choose outdoor events. If you hold a celebration at a business, please ensure that they have appropriate public health measures in place, including space for physical distancing and cleaning protocols. For businesses in level two, gyms, fitness facilities, swimming pools, dance studios, yoga studios, tennis and squash facilities, and arenas can open with a maximum capacity of 50 people per room or rink surface, uh, provided that physical distancing can be maintained. 50 will also be the maximum capacity for facilities such as bingo halls, performance spaces, and cinemas. Again, if all goes well, we will look at raising this maximum in the weeks ahead. Restaurants, bars, and lounges can open for in-person dining, reduced to 50% of normal capacity, as long as physical distancing can be maintained between patrons seated at adjacent tables. Buffets remain prohibited. Where possible, any employee that can work from home should continue to do so. And maintaining work from home policies is really one important way that business, the business community can help keep contacts low. I know that many people in our province, particularly our youth, will be happy to hear that sports teams and organized group activities such as dance, art, music, and performance groups can resume. Initially, teams will be permitted to offer individual act athlete skill development and team practice or training sessions, which could include intra-squad competition, so that's within members of the same team. To return to inter-squad competition, we ask each provincial sport association or other sport provider, including private, recreational, and community-based sports providers, to submit a return to sport plan with Sport NL or the Department of Tourism, Culture, Arts, and Recreation. This plan should include competition that would fall within regular the regular competitive schedule. As an example, if a soccer league has always been regional in scope, regional competition may be permitted following review and approval of the return to sport plan. If the league has always been provincial in scope, it may be permitted to permitted following review and approval of the return to sport plan. The plan should also outline how they can return to games while helping to keep the number of close contacts as low as possible. And we are working with tourism, culture, arts, and recreation to develop a template which organizations can use as a guide for preparing the return to sport plans. Tournaments will not be allowed right now, but may be permitted later in Alert Level 2. Participants in any sport activity should arrive dressed for the activity and avoid change rooms if at all possible and change rooms should only be used when necessary and masks should be worn as much as possible. There should be no social activities associated with group or sports events such as socializing in change rooms. Socializing should only be with those in your household steady, steady twenty. Evidence tells us that higher intensity activities in indoor settings carry a greater risk of viral spread. As the weather improves, we hope that many of these activities can move outdoors where the risk is much lower. Effective Saturday, the special measures orders for personal care homes, long-term care homes, and assisted living facilities that came into force on March 13th will be repealed. With this order repealed, visitation within residential care will expand to a maximum of six designated visitors, allowing residents to reconnect with more loved ones. One thing we need to do differently in level two is wearing our masks more. We should wear our mask anytime we are in indoor public spaces, or interacting with people outside our close, consistent contacts. When you go to a movie, a church service, or a performance, you should keep your mask on the entire time, even when seated, and only remove it to eat or drink. If you are engaged in a low-intensity physical activity, you should keep your mask on if you are able to. And we ask that everyone use their own discretion in determining at what point it should be removed. The more time we have our mask on when we are around others, the better. I know that returning to level two is welcome news, but we need to proceed with caution. And if the virus is once again to introduce, be introduced into our province and begins to circulate widely, we will likely need to lock down again. So the key to preventing another outbreak is for everyone to keep their contacts low. When we do this, the virus does not have the chance to spread as far and as fast. Our shipments of vaccine continue to be rapidly administered by regional health authorities, and over 53,000 doses have been provided to date. Today, we are expanding the pre-registration system to include Indigenous adults living in the province. 
This will help facilitate planning to administer vaccination for this priority group. As we anticipate a significant increase in vaccine supply in the weeks ahead, we are also seeking physicians and pharmacists who are interested in supporting the continued deployment of the provincial COVID-19 vaccination plan. So starting Friday, physicians and pharmacists will have the ability to identify if they would like to administer COVID-19 vaccinations and be immunized themselves. Providers can complete the COVID-19 immunization registration form in either Health ENL or MedAccess. As a recap, for those who may have just joined us, we have one new confirmed case in Chesterdays Media Advisory and the total number of cases in the province is at 1,015. We have a very de delicate balance to achieve right now as we work to vaccinate as many people as possible while preventing another outbreak. It will take everyone's cooperation for us to be able to stay at level two. So please keep your contacts low and practice all your trusted public health measures of hand washing, distancing, and wearing your mask when there are others outside of your close contacts. Each day without COVID in our province is a gift. Now is the time to safely reconnect with one another and get back to the activities we enjoy. Let's appreciate every moment and hold fast in the land of Labrador. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald, a good day indeed. I'm sure many of us are breathing a sigh of relief with today's news. This is great on many levels. Our province has successfully dealt with an outbreak of the variant more people can return to see to their livelihoods and see their loved ones. More and more in the last few weeks, we've all been wondering and hoping about when we would get to see Alert Level 2 again. And here we are. Again, thanks to Dr. Fitzgerald and her team for guiding us through some rough waters. As we've seen firsthand, the restrictions, tough as they may be, work. As we open up, we all need to follow the rules. Now, more than ever. That's how we will stay in Alert Level 2. So enjoy this Alert Level 2, but do, do so responsibly. Masks on, social distance, follow all the public health guidelines. I hope you can safely enjoy these sunny days we're having and know that there are brighter days ahead as more and more vaccines come into the province. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Haggy for some brief remarks. Minister Haggy. Thank you very much, uh, Premier. I just uh, open by um, apologising to the hard of hearing community for uh, the lack of uh, sign language interpreters today. That was unfortunate. Our uh, agency has um, none available, sadly. Um, one new case, three active. Uh, good news to go with the good weather we're currently experiencing. As Dr Fitzgerald says, we have administered now a total of 53,769 doses of uh, vaccines of all kinds. Um, the rollout of the vaccine continues to progress. Uh, we have, as we move into the back end of phase one and into opening up phase two, uh, starting to use a pre-registration process. What this does is uh, allow people to express interest in getting the vaccine uh, and for the back end to make sure they're eligible uh, within that cohort. So they're over 70 or they're uh, home support worker or first responders. Those are the ones we've opened up very recently. Uh, as Dr. Fitzgerald has announced, we're now expanding this with another three categories, uh, adult indigenous off reserve, um, the uh, healthcare workers who were not vaccinated uh, in uh, phase one, uh, and as she mentioned specifically, a pharmacist and physicians who now have the opportunity to also register to be able to administer the vaccine when we move into the mass vaccination stage uh, um, as we go through the levels. Um, the uh, people who have registered, or pre-registered rather, uh, and, and have not yet received their code and their uh, URL, um, don't worry. Uh, we are going through them in the order in which the vaccine comes in, uh, and you've not been forgotten. Uh, we will, uh, when the vaccine is uh, available and we know the promises are there, uh, open up more clinics, and so you will then get uh, a link and a passcode, uh, and you'll be able to go and pick your own site and, and your own date and time. Uh, we haven't forgotten about you. Uh, it's a rolling process as we add ones on to the, the new end, as it were. Uh, the uh, website will be updated with the new groups that are coming on for pre-registration. And within the, uh, <clears throat> the higher-risk uh, categories of phase two, uh, as we add more uh, and announce more pre-registration, 
uh, we will update the website there as well. Um, as the, uh, the vaccine arrives, uh, the clinics are scheduled uh, around that, and they're also varied to allow for some geographical uh, distribution, bearing in mind our large uh, land mass and surface area. So these will change from, uh, from week to week and month to month. So that is one of the reasons why we have left it uh, with um, the, uh, the software, as it were, to allow you to choose uh, on a given occasion. Um, from the point of view of our uh, planning, we're still on track to deliver um, 80,000 doses uh, by the end of next week, by Easter. Um, every eligible person who wants a, a, a dose of the vaccine should be able to have had their first dose uh, around Canada Day. And then we can go back and offer second doses uh, as and when the vaccine continues to arrive. Um, no one will be left behind. Uh, it is simply a question of um, following uh, the rationing, as it were, uh, that Canada has to manage and that in turn we, we get our share. Uh, again, the public health measures that Dr. Fitzgerald has emphasized and the Premier has emphasized have worked and they will continue to work and really will have to be a staple of everyday life for some time yet to come. So uh, I'll close by encouraging everyone to hold fast to those public health principles and hand it back to yourself, Premier. Well, thank you, Minister. I'll now invite uh, questions from the media. Thank you, Premier. For the benefit of our speakers, there are six reporters registered for today's call. The question and answer session will be conducted in two rounds, where each reporter will have the opportunity to ask one question and one follow-up per round. Following this, I will ask each reporter if they have one final question. Our first questions are from Elizabeth Witten with All Newfoundland Labrador. Please go ahead. Thank you. Previously, Dr. Fitzgerald, you said we wouldn't skip these alert levels, that we'd have to just jump through them. And now you've been asked we're going from alert level four to two. So why this change? Um, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, so I think, um, you know, for us, we were looking at the, uh, the numbers and just where we were and how well uh, we have done. Uh, and with uh, so many days uh, in the last couple of weeks with no cases and or one case, um, it just seemed like uh, it was a really uh, prolonging uh, process that didn't need to be prolonged. And so, uh, you know, we've always said that if the evidence points us in a different direction, we will. So I'm very happy to have to take that back and uh, make this make this call today. And I'll have to and, uh, follow up on that. I'm curious, you know, at what point in the last two weeks did you start thinking we're we're going to jump to level three to level two? Uh, I think probably over this weekend and uh, at the beginning of this week, we really, we really, uh, that sort of solidified for us at that, at that point, yeah. Thank you. Our next questions are from Richard Duggan with BOCN. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, Premier Fury, last week uh, you told me that the earliest you could rejoin the Atlantic bubble was around April 9th, and that was due to... Uh, the two-week system in which we were coming down in our alert level. Uh, now with us moving down to alert level two, how does this uh, impact our participation? Well, if, if we can stay at alert level two, and as we've said, things can change based on the epidemiology here, but also the epidemiology in, in the Atlantic provinces, then I think we're on track uh, to uh, hit that April 19th deadline for sure. But um, the, the concept of joining the rest of the Atlantic bubble will depend on alignment of the earlier will depend on alignment of the Atlantic premiers and the chief medical officers of health. But this is a good news. Uh, this is a good, good sign, a good signal that certainly uh, if we can keep the numbers where they are, if everyone continues to dig a little deeper and follow public health guidelines, that we're certainly on track uh, for the middle of April. Thank you. And Dr. Fitzgerald, in your preamble, you mentioned uh, about the, the possibility of other variants uh, eventually arriving here. From this outbreak, what did we learn from this outbreak that can help us now in preparing for future variants arriving here? Um, so we've learned a lot. We're still learning. Um, and uh, certainly I think we realize just, you know, with regard to variants, how quickly they can spread. Um, you know, we all saw that, uh, that curve that just shot up almost straight. Um, that's not what we like to see uh, by any stretch. So I think, you know, we've realized that these, these variants um, have changed the way that we look at this virus. And so 
uh, you know, we've, we've looked at testing and um, increasing testing in rotational workers, for example, um, and uh, it, we're, we have um, uh, guidance that's been developed specifically when we know we're dealing with variants of concern. Um, so I think, you know, we, we certainly um, have learned a lot and, and will certainly have a uh, high degree of suspicion uh, moving forward. We're going to be testing uh, any travel related um, samples or positive samples that we have uh, for uh, the variant. So uh, we're certainly actively looking for it uh, as much as possible. risk for severe disease are certainly our priority groups and that's why people over the age of 70 are being done first um, and uh, we're looking at uh, people who live in congregate settings um, ad ad adults who identify as indigenous all of these groups we know are at higher risk for severe disease and so we are um, targeting those groups and uh, we have um, you know essential workers and uh, healthcare workers as well as first responders and rotational workers included in that group uh, and certainly with the advent of the AstraZeneca vaccine now that does allow us to um, get to those groups a little bit sooner so um, you know we will be um, announcing that when when we know about the stability of the AstraZeneca uh, supply. Uh, okay yesterday we heard of uh uh, a number of uh, 70 plus seniors who have used access codes from their friends or their relatives. They, and it's conceivable a lot of them had no idea they were skipping line. Uh, so, it, you know, again, I'm asking uh, it, it, why is there a reluctance to literally set up a, a hierarchical list of who and when is going to be vaccinated? So, I think. Um, you know, the list that we have in our vaccination plan does list who we feel are the most important people to get done first and then carrying on through the list. However, we do know that people who are at highest risk for severe disease, um, it is more appropriate for them to receive an mRNA vaccine. And so, um, you know, we are um, trying to um, deliver the AstraZeneca vaccine to the, to the groups that um, are not in that same severe uh, risk category for severe disease. Um, and, you know, we don't want to be too prescriptive. We need to have some room to be flexible. Um, and so, um, you know, the list that, as we have it allows us for that flexibility. Our recommendations to schools um, remain as they are and uh, you know so what that means from an operational point of view I guess I'll have to direct to uh, either education or school districts to answer that question. Sorry, Mark, it's quite difficult to hear you. I apologize. Oh. Do you mind repeating, uh, speaking perhaps a little louder? Sure, I'll turn on my mic. Is that okay. better? Yeah, that's much better. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Uh, we've been hearing from some nurses, and uh, we're wondering, what do you say to nurses uh, who uh, have been vaccinated, uh, fear their risk of exposure, and don't know when they'll be back? Uh, so certainly we will be getting to healthcare workers very soon, and as soon as we... Um, have those plans in place, we will be letting people know, and it, it will be soon. Thank you. Our next questions are from Kellyanne Roberts with NTV. Please go ahead. Thank you. I'm going to follow. 
follow up with uh, Peter Jackson's questions there. In regards to the phases, we've seen the list within the phases. I think the concern for a lot of people is not knowing, we see this list, but not knowing where you land on that list. You say highest risk first. Why not come out with a clear, risk, clear list of saying it's first responders, it's healthcare workers that haven't been vaccinated yet, then it's teachers, then it's listeners. Why not have this list set so that people aren't always worried that they've been missed? Um, so, I guess I'm not sure what about the list that we put up there is not answering the question. Um, we have the list of people of each of the groups. I mean, we can't differentiate every single essential worker. Um, that would be exhaustive. And uh, I, I don't know that we would get everybody. I mean, we've had, uh, so we have um, defined groups as best we can. Um, but, uh, you know, and healthcare workers are in there specifically. Um, and we are working through them. So our goal right now is to get uh, those people with the highest risk of severe disease, which is certainly our, um, you know, our, our over 70. We know age is the biggest risk factor for severe disease. Um, and, uh, and then we'll be moving through the rest of the categories that are in the list that we put up there. Um, knowing that the AstraZeneca vaccine can, we can use those for some of the other groups that are like we have for first responders at this point. Um, and, uh, and that, you know, as we have more AstraZeneca vaccine, we'll be able to offer it to other groups. Sorry, maybe I should clarify. In terms of the list that you do have for phase two, you, you know, we've seen it that it's um, essential workers, frontline uh, teachers. I, I'm just wondering, so the list there, is that the order you're looking to go through? Because that's, I think, where people are confused. They see a lot of people in the phase two category, but not knowing the hierarchy of it. We know that it's highest risk first, but to everybody, they believe they are the highest risk. So just wondering, is the list that we see, is that the order we're going through where on the top it's 70 plus, and then it's uh, uh, teachers, then it's vocational workers? That, that's where I think there's a lot of confusion so you're, right now. You're looking for the hierarchy within the phases itself. Yes, yes. So yes. the way that they're written there now is the way that we're hoping to move through the groups. However, bearing in mind that as we get more AstraZeneca, the groups that are appropriate to receive AstraZeneca vaccine will will receive the AstraZeneca vaccine as we get it as well. So it may be that there's a point that there's two parallel streams happening, um, but that generally speaking, that is the hierarchy that we're moving through. Thank you, that's clarified, so thank you. Our next questions are from Patrick Butler with Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Hello, question for the Premier. Uh, Mr. Perry, what do you make of the fact elections that now allowed a handful of voters that to vote? Uh, by phone when everyone else had to vote by mail or, or in person in advance poll? Uh, and, you know, as I said from the beginning, I'm not uh, responsible for running the election. They are. Uh, I understand that they're dealing with it in an open and transparent way. Uh, I can't speak to why it happened or, or how they made that decision. Uh, and I would suggest, uh, you know, you kind of ask them about it. But it's always uh, troubling when you hear things uh, that are outside the the norm, but uh, I understand Elections NL is handling it now in an open and transparent way. And this morning, the leader of the opposition, Jess Crosby, said um, that this election is making a laughing stock of Newfoundland and Labrador. Do you agree? No, Newfoundland and Labrador is not a laughing stock, and anyone who says otherwise is wrong. Thank you. was made before I mean the discussions happened before that letter came out and uh, you know so we had been considering it it didn't really factor in at all thank you and on the government website it says restaurants can open at 50 percent capacity in alert level three but in alert level two it says they can open at reduced capacity so I just uh, want a little clarification for the, the restaurant workers out there um, is it still 50 percent for, in, in this alert level. Yes, it will be 50% capacity for now. 
um, that uh, uh, information should be updated to, um, very shortly, actually, if it's not um, updated already. <clears throat> Our plan is up on the website, so I don't know why they aren't able to, to get the information. Okay, and uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, I've heard uh, that some rotational workers have been vaccinated at their work sites in other provinces, such as DC, for example. Um, how does that impact our ability to keep track of vaccination when we have people from here getting vaccinated in other parts of the, con uh, other parts of the country? Um, logistically, how does that work? Um, so we have a process to, um, you know, get that information. So if somebody comes forward and says they've been vaccinated, uh, presumably they'll be given some information to, uh, to indicate that they've been vaccinated. So I would say to people, if you've been vaccinated elsewhere, please hold on to any information that they give you about that so that you, you have some evidence to, um, and, and often they'll write the type of vaccine that you got and that sort of thing. So that's important information to know, but if need be, we can get that information. We just reach out to the, um, to the public health units um, in whatever province uh, or territory people are in. Um, that process has been there all along. Um, you know, we have lots of people who transfer, kids who transfer into our province who, um, you know, we need to update their vaccines or we need to carry on with their vaccination schedules. So there is a process that's been in place for a long time of how to share that information. Thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Jackson with the Telegram. Please go ahead. Uh, hi. Um, the, uh, uh, the public service should that should it be taking a more broad policy stance on working from home? And that's been a constant and consistent recommendation from the chief medical officer of health. I guess that's a question for. Fury or uh, the minister? Uh, of course, most of the public service is working at home right now. And uh, as Dr. Fitzgerald has said, uh, if you can work from home, you should. And that changes, obviously, with the changing levels and the changing epidemiology. Um, but uh, most of the most, I mean, the, the building is fairly empty here. I think uh, Dr. Fitzgerald is, and I would agree that the hallways are empty. Most people are working from home if they can. I know uh, the public service has done a, 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 an amazing job in adapting to these, uh, this crisis in particular. And some have come and take their, works, their workstation home, their, you know, their laptops home, their specific chair at home if they have occupational uh, health issues. So I really commend everybody for uh, going that extra mile and, and stepping up and, and working from home, which can equally be trying, as, as we all know. comes from um, certainly um, and and exactly what the situation is unfortunately um, you know I don't think that that is happening very often that the chief public health officer is actually granting um, exemption to quarantine to um, workers um, certainly there are some essential workers that come into the into the country that are granted those exemptions um, and, uh, you know, so we would have to look at it on a case by case basis, I guess, but in general, no, we have our policies in place. They're there for, uh, the protection of everyone. And right now it is as it stands. Thank you. Our next questions are from Mark Quinn with CDC. Please go ahead. Yes. Um, just for a bit of clarity. 
clarity on the people who um, booked uh, using someone else's uh, booking code. Uh, I heard from a woman um, uh, who said that she had done this and uh, didn't realize that it may have consequences for other people. And she wonders if it would be best for her to cancel uh, her booking and wait to be rebooked later, or should she just go ahead and, and get the vaccine uh, with the booking that she made? Well, is that for you, Minister? Certainly, uh, from the point of view of um, my information from uh, NLCHI, who oversee the, uh, the software, no one outside the high-risk category of over 70 uh, is actually, uh, has actually been included and given an inappropriate appointment. Uh, I think uh, the other comment uh, from, um, from Eastern Health and NLCHI is that uh, you know, this problem has now been fixed. Uh, if this person is in the category of high risk and has an appointment, I would suggest it's probably as important that they get a vaccine in their arm as not. Thank you. I think that clarifies that for this particular case. But I think other people who are over 70 who booked may have the same question, so that should clarify things for them. Um, the other question I had is um, for Dr. Fitzgerald. If all the evidence uh, does suggest that it's, uh, you, know, you feel it's safe to move to level two on Saturday, um, people are asking, why not do it now? People ask that every single time, I think. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're still waiting. We wanted to give it the two weeks as we, um, as we had suggested that is an incubation period. So that's why we wait the two weeks. Um, and, you know, hopefully things don't go sideways between now and then. <laughs> um, if it does, we may have to reconsider that, but, uh, um, yeah, so that's, that's the reason why we're waiting is the two weeks. Thank you. Uh, Mark, if I could offer a comment that I heard from businesses of the St. John's Board of Trade, um, their, um, their members actually need some lead time to be able to prepare staffing and ordering and bringing in food, for example, in situation of restaurants and these kind of things. So they were very keen that they would have some advance notice, uh, otherwise they would, uh, they would be at a, a business disadvantage. Uh, I, I'm going to take a liberty, if you don't mind. I've just had a note passed to me by staff that a uh, modest number of individuals who are receiving appointments by email are finding the email from the regional health authorities in their spam folder uh, and they're uh, turning up late. Uh, so uh, with the help of the media, it would be useful if that piece of information could get out there so that people who may not be as familiar uh, would look in their spam or junk folders uh, before uh, calling because they feel they haven't got an appointment. So I'm sorry about the liberty, but I thought it was the only opportunity I might get. Thank you. Our next questions are for Kellyanne Roberts with NTD. Please go ahead. Thank you. Dr. Fitzgerald, Canada's Chief Science Advisor, Dr. Mona Zimmer, uh, has advised against extending the time between doses to four months for seniors. Um, this is based on recent data and efficacy coming through several studies. What is the province looking to do here? Are we looking to make a change for those seniors to go back to 28 days, or are we still looking to continue with four months? Um, so at this time, we're taking our guidance from the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations, which has been the trusted committee that we have relied on for many, many, many years, uh, and uh, has guided us through all of this. So um, we are... Um, we're taking our um, lead from them. Certainly the um, uh, evidence that we have seen uh, from within um, our own country in Quebec and, and British Columbia is that um, you know there is still um, a robust response uh, from an immune point of view. We do see a reduction in, uh, in cases and in severe disease and symptomatic disease even in the elderly. And so the expectation is that that immunity does not wane um, very quickly, you know, it won't wane kind of overnight. So um, certainly the evidence that we have right now is indicating that uh, an extended period is safe. Obviously, if that changes, um, certainly if, if we see more evidence that uh, points us in, in a different direction, then we will, we will pivot and move that way, as we've always said we would do. But right now we're still taking our, our guidance from the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations. Thank you. And there's a lot of concern coming up about AstraZeneca. We, we've seen it before in terms of several countries um, halting the use while an investigation is ongoing. 
now we're hearing about a recent study in the United States where outdated data might have been used. Um, a lot of people who were already hesitant about being vaccinated, this may have increased and heightened that fear, especially when it comes to AstraZeneca. Uh, what is to happen to those who might refuse the AstraZeneca vi- uh, vaccine? Do they get moved to the back of the line or, or what happens in this situation? Um, so first of all, you know, what we know about AstraZeneca right now is that it is safe and it is effective. Um, certainly there, there have been some signals uh, and you know, the whole process of vaccine uh, vis- vigilance, uh, this is what it does. We look for these signals once we get out in the real world and we start using this vaccine you know, in millions of people um, that we look for any of these signals that could um, you know, be uh, early warnings uh, for something. Certainly with regard to um, you know, blood clots um, and what they call pulmonary embolism, so these are blood clots in your legs or in other parts of the body, um, that uh, signal, there, certainly we're not seeing that in a higher, uh, at a higher rate than what we would expect to see in the general population. And so there are you know, uh, 11 million doses in the, in the UK and they haven't seen that kind of, um, that kind of signal there. Um, the other um, disorder that they were talking about with these uh, central sinus uh, thrombosis, sinus vein thrombosis, um, that is uh, certainly being investigated and it is still exceedingly rare. However, we have to remember that, uh, you know, I'm not sure of the exact number of cases at this point, but, you know, when we talk about millions of doses given and the number of cases are in the single um, or very uh, small double digits. so. Um, this is not a, a very common thing that's happening at all, and certainly from a risk benefit point of view, you know, the uh, the risks, um, the benefits of getting the vaccine are really um, far outweigh the risks at this point. So um, it's important to really remember that if somebody chooses, uh, for whatever reason, not to get uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, then, uh, you know, they, they certainly have the opportunity then to wait for the mRNA vaccine uh, with their age group. Uh, Kelly, just to, just to pick up, I mean, I, th- I think it's important that people understand that there's been no link to causality here whatsoever. So the, I think that's fair to say, right, Dr. Fitzgerald, that there's no link between AstraZeneca causing any clots. Clots, clots exist in, in life. And, there's no evidence to date that AstraZeneca is, is linked to a causal relationship when it comes to uh, DVTs or PEs. Thank you. I'll now go back through each reporter to see if you have one final question. Elizabeth Witten with All Newfoundland Labrador. Do you have a final question? Uh, no, I'm good, thanks. Thanks, Elizabeth. Richard Duggan with BOCN. Do you have a final question? as much as possible in the daytime, recognizing that the majority of children who are in um, all day child care obviously would be uh, likely too young uh, to be able to comply with wearing a mask all day. Uh, those that come for after school programs, certainly uh, the rec- recommendation would be that as much as possible that they wear a mask. Uh, if they are eating at, you know, the, those sorts of things and, and seated at tables, then uh, obviously they wouldn't be wearing their masks, but otherwise, yeah, as much as possible indoors. Thank you. Peter Jackson with the Telegram. Do you have a final question? Uh, yes, very quickly, Dr. Fitzgerald, I wanted to follow up on my last question. Uh, is it fair for me to say that the federal quarantine law is not the only consideration uh, in your assessment of international worker care? Uh, so certainly um, it's a big consideration. You know, we can't override federal quarantine law, um, and, uh, but it's not the only consideration. Uh, we do have to look at other things as well. And we know that uh, certainly internationally, there's, a, there's concern, you know, with uh, other variants that, are, um, that we're seeing in other areas of the world. 
and uh, and about the importation of that. So so there's certainly uh, uh, other con other considerations, but obviously we can't override a federal quarantine order. Okay, thank you very much. Mark Quinn with CDC. Do you have a final question? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, as uh, the number of people vaccinated increases uh, in Newfoundland Labor, but also in other parts of the world, um, will that change travel in and out of the province? For example, someone asked me um, if someone's received two doses of the vaccine, uh, will they be able to come to Newfoundland without having to uh, self-isolate for 14 days at some point in the future? At some point in the future. I mean, yeah. <laughs> ultimately, yeah, that is our, ultimately, that is our goal, uh, for sure. Um, we are still learning about the effects of this vaccine on the transmission of virus, and so that's really important. And as time goes on and as we vaccinate more people, I think we'll get that information. Um, but as of right now, we just haven't got enough people vaccinated that we can really uh, determine that at this point. In certain small groups, perhaps we can, but, but not in, in the population as a whole. Um, so for right now, we do have to still maintain those uh, public, public health measures. Um, but you know, we'll we'll see what the next couple of months holds for us, and uh, what kind of information we get out of that. Uh, but we do have to remember the most important thing is that you know you're not considered fully vaccinated until you have that second dose. We know that you get a substantial amount of protection with one dose, and that's why we want to do as many people as we can with one dose. Uh, but to get that um, sort of uh, that little bit of increased protection as well as long-term protection. Uh, the second dose is really important. So we have to consider that uh, as much as we all are looking forward to having everybody vaccinated with one dose of this vaccine, um, you're really not fully vaccinated until you've had the second. Thank you. Kellyanne Roberts with NTV. Do you have a final question? Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, you, know, you noted that there might be two parallel lines happening at once in terms of the vaccine rollout plan. Right, we, right now we know, based on the federal government's website here, that there's no allocation for more AstraZeneca vaccine to the province right now. If there was to be more coming, who is next in line for that after we go through first responders? Um, so as we, it's hard, you know, to make that, to say that, uh, um, right now, because we don't know exactly the amount that we're getting. We don't have those confirmed supplies. So, um, we don't really want to uh, put that out there until we know. So, um, and once we do, we we'll certainly be quite transparent about who will be able to receive that. Thanks. Thank you everyone. Premier, do you have any final comments for today? Thank you all for joining us today uh, because of your hard work, each and every one of you at home in following the public health guidelines, we're able to get to a bright day today and into the weekend. So uh, it's good news for Newfoundland and Labrador today. Uh, we're seeing uh, the fruits of our labor, uh, the fruits of the sacrifice that everybody has made, uh, businesses, individuals, communities, families who have followed the rules and, and followed Dr. Fitzgerald's guidance. Uh, so today is a good day, but we need to keep it that way by following the rules as, as, and don't let COVID fatigue or COVID complacency set in. Uh, it will be what keeps us at alert level two, which is where we want to be until everyone is vaccinated. Uh, so there were dark days, we got through them and we will continue to get through this uh, phase of this uh, pandemic uh, together. So everyone stay strong, stay safe, and we'll get through the, this next phase together as well. Thank you, Premier. Stay safe, everyone. Take care of yourselves and each other and enjoy the rest of your day. This is